<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining early our U Taiwan uh, U.S. Taiwan High School. Oh, we have someone. Uh, all right, please mute yourself. Yes. All right. Yeah. So welcome to join early, and we're happy to have you today. Now we have uh, sixty plus people joining right now, and now we're eighty right now. As when we turn into seven thirty my time, I mean New York time zone, seven thirty p.m. Taiwan's a.m. East West Coast four thirty, and now we have more people tuning in while we're waiting. You may download the play uh, program book. Uh, let me send you the link again. So for early people, please download the program book so you have side by side with you during the talk. Here's the program book. And so you can learn more about the speaker's background, what we are going to talk about, and so a Q&A session that you are able to ask some questions. So please download and have it with you during the talk. We're so excited to have everyone here from different time zones. While we're waiting, please leave us a message in the chat box to let us know where you're watching from. I know we have people from Silicon Valley, I'm based in New York, and some people are in Taiwan. Leave us a message. We'd love to learn more about you and we'd love to, you know, to create more engagement. So uh, while you download the play uh, program book, if you have any questions or any, you know, uh, can I open the link or something, or can I ask questions, feel free to leave it in the chat box. And we're happy to answer the questions. We have our Nadia staff over here to help you to answer any questions. All right, Taiwan, I saw some people say Taiwan. From California, hello, Alan, hello, Juan. Kinju, oh wow, Indiana, Vancouver. Okay, we have some Canada audience. Uh huh. Netherlands, it's really cool. So now we are reaching out to some Europe country, Chicago, Seattle. Welcome, welcome. I know it's early in Taiwan. But we're so happy that everyone joined it. Uh, download link. Let me send you it again. Uh, or can our uh, staff send you, send everyone the link? All right. Program book. Here. Uh, if you cannot find the program book link, you can go to our official website under the program section and you will see the like yearly uh, program book over there from this year, last year, and the year before. All right. So I'm going to start. Now we have so many people join us from different places. We have 100 people joining right now. So I think we're ready to start. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So my name is Alice, Alice Cole. Um, I'm based in New York and working at an HRSS company called Worka. We build cross-border teams for startups. I'm also Nadia's board of directors this year. I'm so happy to hear with you. And so let's kick off. So first of all, Nadia, I appreciate all the sponsors to support us. Let's welcome Minister of Wu Zhengzhong to give us a two minutes short opening. Good afternoon and good morning, ladies and gentlemen in US and Taiwan. On behalf of the Ministry of Science and Technology Taiwan, it's my pleasure to join you today at the US Taiwan High Tech Forum. First, I would like to commend Natia in Silicon Valley for hosting the important event. Due to Natia's long term dedication, US Taiwan High Tech Forum has become one of the most vital platforms to connect tech communities between Taiwan and the United States, especially in Silicon Valley. Taiwan and Silicon Valley have had very close cooperation on technology, mostly in hardware. Taiwan firms form an integral part of U.S. technology supply chains, and our technology cooperation has been a major force in promoting the U.S.-Taiwan economy together for years. 
as we move on into the digital age, the nature of our technology cooperation will fundamentally change. Today's forum topic is very meaningful. It is by strengthening connections that we can bring the relationship in tech industries between Taiwan and Silicon Valley into the digital age. In recent years, people are facing a dramatic change from digital transformation, which not only creates a big impact to economy, but also strikes life behavior and governance. In Taiwan, to overcome the challenges and to embrace the opportunities from digital transformation, Recently, we focused on enhancing Taiwan's internet infrastructures, developing beyond 5G satellite communications, and most importantly, establishing cybersecurity ability. We also pay particular attention to innovative research on advanced semiconductors and quantum technologies. Digital transformation in key industry sectors, such as machinery, healthcare, energy, agriculture, etc., are also undergoing through the five plus two industrial innovation projects launched by President Tsai Ing-wen five years ago. To the end of my words, I'm confident with the long-term and the solid partnership between Taiwan and the Silicon Valley, we together can contribute more to the future of global digitalization. I look forward to a successful and a fruitful forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Science and Technology, for their support. And good afternoon sorry. and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go to the next slide. And our, uh, uh, moreover, we have we also wanted to thank Digital, Digital Times. Digital Times is a daily newspaper that offers the latest semiconductor, consumer electronics, IT, communications industries in both English and Mandarin Chinese. So you may visit their website uh, link uh, over here. We also have staff can post a link in the chat. The moreover, the president of Digital Times, Kali Huang, will be our last speaker of the day. So please stay tuned. You'll find more information of Digital Times, Digital Times link in the chat. So uh, last but not the least, we also wanted to thank our uh, community partners. Uh, IEEE Young Professionals, Stanford Club of Taiwan, TSIA, Taiwan Semiconductor Industry Association, and Anchor Taiwan for all the support. So uh, now let's welcome Nadia, Silicon Valley President Rex Chang. He is well connected between US and Taiwan. He also has 15 years of industry experience developing software and productizing mobile technologies. So, Rex, please take away. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. And uh, good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, we're really glad to host um, our uh, 24th annual US Taiwan High Tech Forum. Um, Alice, if you can go to the next slide. Um, it's really a great opportunity uh, to do this um, over the years. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, we started uh, this endeavor uh, more than 20 years ago, and we're glad that we can continue to host this event. Um, you know, despite with the pandemic, uh, we have shifted this to an online conference, and uh, we hope that through this conference, there can be more technological exchange, uh, innovative ideas, and also professional networking uh, from our friends here in Silicon Valley, uh, here in North America, as well as a lot of um, uh, friends that are in Taiwan. Um, and I also, also want to introduce uh, the nonprofit Natia. Uh, this is a 513 a nonprofit organization registered here in the state of California. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. And so this is actually our 30 year anniversary for this nonprofit organization. Uh, it was founded um, in 1991. Uh, by Dr. Zhang Yu and several of other academia and industry advisors. And we're really grateful that this organization has continued to support uh, the, the, the professionals here in Silicon Valley, as well as our other chapters here in the United States and in Canada. Um, so if you have a, you know, interested to know about Natia, you can go to our website at www.natea.org. And let me uh, just also kind of briefly introduce what Natia is uh, as a community. Um, so we are a nonprofit, as I mentioned, 
and we provide a platform for professionals in science engineering or, or interested in science engineering to learn new things. Um, for example, we have today our high tech forum. Uh, we also um, in September have our startup forum event. And earlier this year, uh, with uh, one of our new initiatives, our uh, Women's Summit, where we have very engaging women investors where they can share live experience as well as connect with our community. Uh, we also host some smaller events throughout the year. Uh, some of these are tech talks. Uh, some of these are offline gatherings among the professionals here in Silicon Valley as well. We're also building a, a networking, a kind of job platform uh, for professionals who are looking for jobs or who are transitioning to different roles. And please stay tuned for that as we evolve in that program as well. So there's a combination of offline and online events um, that we are hosting as an organization. And if you can go to the next slide, um, you can follow us on, uh, if you want more information, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook group. We also have a, a public Facebook page uh, as well as a LinkedIn page. And in those uh, social media sites, you can see uh, some of our information about our upcoming events or, or just kind of general uh, technology information that our community share with each other. So we hope that you can join us. Uh, these are free platforms and our, uh, our model is to uh, have more reach to the community and that uh, more of these technology exchange can happen. And with that, um, I'll uh, turn it back to Alice. Thank you, Rex. Yeah. So remember to follow us and subscribe our newsletter and you're uh, receive our monthly events like Rex mentioned uh, and all other, you know, fun events and then some, you know, insights uh, from our experts were like today. So let me just walk you, uh, walk everyone through a little bit of our agenda tonight. We're morning in Taiwan's time. We're somewhere in the Europe. Um, so we were uh, start with keynote speaker with Yang Lu, and we were have other speakers, Jimmy Goodrich, to talk about semi industry uh, from the semi industry association, Brian Share to talk about the applied materials, and last but not the least, we have Kali Huang from Digi Times. Yeah, so. Uh, this will be our agenda today. Four speakers, uh, we uh, talk about different um, a uh, aspects. And remember to sign out our part two, which is next Friday's event. Uh, it's the same link, same on like website, and um, you sign out on Eventbrite, and you're able to see uh, our part two event. We will talk about blockchain. So you will have uh, three different panel, uh, speakers, um, yes. Yeah, so please sign up. And I also wanted to acknowledge and thanks for our committee. Uh, that I wanted to shout out for them that uh, for this Nadia's U.S. High Tech Committee team, led by Joseph Chan, along with three program chairs and three committee members, we wouldn't have had today's event without them. And in addition. We also have uh, our Nadia members, volunteers, and students who dedicated their time to support and broadcast this event. We now have almost 200 people are watching online right now, just from WebEx. Uh, I'm sure there are more people on Facebook, so it's very exciting. And we're, we're just getting everything ready. And uh, just a small reminder before we officially start, I know we go through a lot of slides, so be patient with me. Uh, if you have any questions during the Q&A session, you can find on down the bottom part, uh, there will be, there's a Q&A, uh, let me point my pointer over here, Q&A session, and put your questions over there. We will have five minutes to uh, ask the speaker questions. So you can put as early as possible and we, our staff will, uh, you know, generate the questions and answer them, something like that. Yeah. So, and I promise you, so this is, so this is it. Are you guys ready? And um, let me check with our speakers. All right, all right. Sorry, uh, 
think there's something wrong with my laptop, but I'm gonna get back to it. Okay, so welcome again to US Taiwan High Tech Forum. We are thrilled to have Yang Liu as our speak keynote speaker today. Yang Liu is Chief of Executive of Officer and Chairman of Hong High Technology Group, Foxconn, the world's largest electronics manufacturer and the leading global science and technology solution provider. Mr. Liu is also a recognized entrepreneur and innovator with over four decades of industry experience. So with any further ado, let's welcome Yang Liu. Virtual cafe for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. My name is Yang Liu. I'm the chairman of Foxconn Group. And I'd like to share with you uh, the new awareness of the semiconductor technology and supply chain during this you know, COVID-19 era. Now, I will cover moving. I will cover four topics in this talk. First will be the advancement of a semiconductor. Second, a country designed for semiconductor leadership. Third, the boundaries among segments become vague. And fourth, the icing shortage, which is you know, a very, very uh, popular topic recently in uh, automotive industry. And then I'll give a summary of this new awareness that I have observed. And uh, I think you know, every one of you uh, also uh, felt that life now cannot do without a uh, semiconductor these days. Semiconductor is in, you know, every, uh, uh, in the, our lives, in every aspect, especially in communication, uh, banking, transportation, healthcare, and uh, you know, military, you name it. Semiconductor is no, no longer a gadget, it is our life. Okay. And uh, you know, AI has gone through several revolutions without success. And recently, you, you see a lot of uh, AI activities. And one of the reasons is you know, because in the past, the semiconductor that the AI was running uh, on was too slow. And it is not until the semiconductor becomes more powerful, the new deep learning algorithm can then be applied. And also, the mass data you know, can be shared in the cloud. And then the training that makes the training of uh, uh, data for the AI can be you know, shared among the uh, uh, various users. That makes the AI become smarter enough to be useful. Okay, next. And the smart manufacturing, smart farming, smart uh, agriculture, smart shopping, online and grocery store, smart housing, smart transportation, you name it. You know, everything needs to be smart. You know? And everything is propelled by semiconductor. Next. But it is just the beginning. To adjust to the new normal, people need more semiconductor devices to communicate remotely, to protect themselves, to shop online, and even live in a virtual world like metaverse. It seems all killer applications or breakthroughs will need to help need the help from a semiconductor. Next. The semiconductor supply chain used to be global, and countries worked as a team. The new awareness of the semiconductor importance breaks the current semiconductor supply chain systems. People are building walls, and the boundaries become unsurmountable. Next. 
And uh, the U.S.-China trade wall is essentially a wall for technology. The, U the U.S. passes uh, the Endless Frontier ACT and the Eagle Act to restrict China's development. China also passes a countermeasure anti-foreign sanction law. Three years ago, Foxconn founder Mr. Guo had foreseen this situation that they will become one world, two systems, and we call it G2. Okay. Next. And even more, you know, there are 17 European uh, member states wants to develop their own semiconductor technology, you know, even down to like two nanometers. If Europe insists on building her own semiconductor supply chain, it will not only be G2, it, will, it could be G3 and become more fragmented. Next. And with the new awareness of semiconductors importance, the semiconductor boundary among countries are, bu are being built. The one global semiconductor uh, supply chain become the, becomes geopolitical. U.S., China, Europe, Japan, and India are racing to enhance or develop their own semiconductor capabilities. Protectionism, techno technological barriers, and alliance make high-tech supply chain geopolitical. Taiwan, in this sense, is very unique in this new situation because Taiwan is very strong in semiconductor and uh, Taiwan is helping other countries like US, Japan, and might be other countries in the future to build their own semiconductor supply chain at home. From the supply chain segment point of view, the traditional, traditionally defined semiconductor segment boundary is breaking up and companies are crossing segment boundaries for their own benefits. The graph I'm showing below shows the semiconductor supply, uh, uh, semiconductor supply industry chain plus electric module and systems. The graph is plotted according to semiconductor goods delivery logistics. The left side, left hand side is the upstream and the right hand side is the downstream. The traditionally defined uh, semiconductor uh, segment boundaries among material, equipment, fab, package, IC design houses, system houses are breaking up. Wafer fab can contribute more than half of advanced packaging revenues. Allset is, is expanding into EMS territory. System houses like uh, Apple, Amazon, and uh, uh, Google all started designing their own SOCs. System houses are now very valuable uh, customers to the wafer uh, foundries. Next. The wafer fabs are using you know, a, a 65 uh, nanometer backhand process to achieve tiny pitches that uh, OSET cannot reach. TSMC, Intel, and Samsung have their own 2.5D or 3D package technologies. TSMC's Cobos is the most popular technology in the industry at the moment. The package houses are using system and chip technologies to expand into EMS territory and increase revenue that way. So as you can see, the most widely uh, known story is Apple designed their own SOCs for their own cell phones and also um, Mac Air. Other examples from uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and te even Tesla uh, also you know, 
can also be easily found. Next. The automotive supply chain also faces challenges and needs to have an alternative approach. Next. The automotive companies, OE, you know, like OEMs with our AMPs, this is what they use, the term they use in that industry. The OE suffer from IC shortage, you know, especially after the COVID-19, which gives them good reasons to reconsider the tier one, tier two, tier three supply chain structures. According to CNBC News, the revenue loss due to the IC shortage to reach 210 billion US dollars in 2021 for the uh, automotive uh, industries. The non-transparency of the supply chain is causing problems. Next. The left graph uh, shows computing power requirement and the number of sensors increase from uh, level two to level four. At level two, we will need about six sensors. At level four, you will need about 29 sensors per car. The computing power will also increase from several uh, tops to several hundred tops. It means not, uh, we not only need more semiconductors, but also we need more advanced semiconductor. The right graph compares the semiconductor contents in dollars amount between uh, the, the dollar amount between ICE vehicles and the battery EV, uh, EVs. In 2020, an ICE vehicle contained an average of about $396. Uh, dollars of value of uh, semiconductor content, one EV could contain up to like $834 uh, dollars, uh, semiconductors. It's a, a little more than two folds. Next. Just like the system houses, the car maker Tesla also designed the uh, her own SOCs. Tesla has designed a chip called Dojo to improve the performance and auto uh, auto uh, uh, of autopilot. According to Reuters, Volkswagen also you know, trying to develop their own SOCs for their own needs in the, uh, in some cases. And definitely Taiwan can help the auto industry, but there is this uh, barriers. The automotive industry is now developing uh, CASE applications, which needs a lot of a semiconductor. Taiwan has the advantage in semiconductor and ICT industries. There are bar but there are barriers that are preventing Taiwan uh, companies from helping directly because Taiwan has no access to car makers and the information for product design. And that's why Honghai, you know, to solve that problem, Honghai initiated the EV open platform called MIH platforms. MIH opens the door to allow semiconductor players to access to the auto, uh, early design stage and share information with more than you know, 2,000 members. MIH plays a very important role as you know, like uh, TL 0.5. As you can see on the right graph, the information can be passed to the uh, supplier earlier and the quicker. MIH Alliance gathers the resources and modulize the responsibilities. As a result, the development time and the, de the development cost will be saved in designing and making EVs. Semiconductors 
can help EV. EV needs help from semiconductor. The supply chain issues can be eased by the MIH platform. This is Taiwan's opportunity to be in the driver's seat of the next big thing. MIH will become an independent, no, MIH has become an independent organization since uh, July 1st, 2021. Let me uh, summarize the, you know, the old, the new awareness. First, countries realize semiconductor supply is not, is a national security issue. Secondly, citizen companies realize that they need to have their own SOC. It is a way to differentiate. Third, automotive companies realize they rely too much on tier one, which brings risks to manufacturing and hinders progress, it's especially during this COVID-19 COVID situation. Fourthly, uh, EV is the next big thing. Taiwan, with her strength in semiconductor and ICT industry, stands a great chance to succeed. MIH, the Open Platform Alliance, is the catalyst to success. And that's it for today, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Liu, to give us this insightful talk. So we have some questions for you um, that on, on top of what you just mentioned about the EV part. So this year, 2021, has been full of surprises like the supply shortage that you mentioned. So from Boxconn's perspective, what do you think the root cause might be? That is the first part of the question. Uh, maybe uh, first let me show the, the uh, next page. Uh, Alice, can you see this page? Yes, thank you. Okay, so with this page, this, uh, this is from Gartner. Okay. If you look at the, uh, their uh, statistics, you know, in 2021, okay, the, uh, the demand grow by about 19.7%, while the supply of the wafers only grow about 5.1%. So there is a huge imbalance between the supply and demand. But by looking at this, then you know, definitely you know, they will cause big shortages because the, you know, the supply cannot keep up with the demand. But you know, if we further look into this, then we have to think about you know how come there's so you know the the demand surge so to so high. And we're still looking into this. You know, there are uh, a lot of saying about why it's you know growing so high. You know, partly you know, people are guess guesstimating that uh, maybe you know people you know, they double booking or they put inventory, you know, too many inventory because they are very concerned about the situations. But, you know, if I look at uh, our announcement uh, yesterday, you know, in the first 10 months of this year, Foscon, Foscon's revenues has grown about seven, 17 17%, 17.53%. So that's you know, probably inconsistent with what uh, uh, they're showing here is about 19.7%. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we think, oh, this may be a true you know, demand and the supply imbalance causing this supply chain you know, situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, with that said, you know, if you look at the the, the uh, forecast by uh, Gartner, uh, next year, uh, the demand will only grow about eight by 8.8%. 8 .8%. The supplier will grow approximately 3.1%. So, you know, the, the gap becomes narrower. 
Mm -hmm. so by looking at that, we estimate that uh, next year, hopefully, you know, maybe the second half of the next year, uh, the shortage will ease, will ease up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we see. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because I remember when um, recently I bought a new car and and uh, so, uh, the car dealer was like, it's because of Taiwan. The, the, you know, the <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> no, it's not. It's very, very complicated. If you look at the, the port uh, situation in uh, Long Beach, you know, it got stuck there also. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then jumping a little bit to the uh, EV. So, what what do you think that can you share more thoughts on the potential impact to the future opportunities for semiconductor related industry, particularly to the EV industry? Yeah, if you could comment on this. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, the use of the semiconductor will become more and more, and due to the uh, become more and more for the EVs versus the traditional ICE cars, okay? And also due to the extreme weather situation, that prepares the conversion from the ICE cars you know, to the EVs much faster. So, you know, I, with that, you know, my forecast is that the semiconductor for the automotive uh, industry will become you know, uh, bigger and bigger, bigger than what uh, we can imagine. So uh, I would say uh, the most of the automakers that we uh, we work with, they're all working very hard to have their own supply, you know, of their own ICs. Mm -hmm. So you will see a big change, I think, before 2024. Oh. Mm -hmm before 2024, that uh, the semiconductor supply chain uh, for the automotive industry will have big change. We have an audience over here, Jin Yong Yang. Uh, he wanted to know, uh, uh, so his question is, uh, I'm guessing it's a he, we know that Boscom bought a low small motor Ohio plant. What is the next step? Would Foxconn gradually move to the business to e EV? Yeah, I think uh, the Lordstown Motor that we uh, bought uh, uh, in uh, Ohio. Um, first of all, you know, we will uh, transform that uh, factory into a uh, a a contract manufacturing uh, for the for the for the cars which is very, very uh, unique. You know, you know, in the past, I would say most of the cars are made by the uh, car OEMs itself. And country manufacturing for the auto industry is quite new, okay? And with that, uh, what we intend to do is not only we're gonna build the cars for Lodestar Motor, but also we're going to build cars for other uh, other uh, automakers. As you know, we announced uh, in the news that uh, Fisker's car, the next generation of Fisker's car, will be made in Ohio, and mm -hmm. you know, some others to come. Okay, mm -hmm. That's some others to come. Okay, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you also mentioned about like Boston has been promoting MIH and uh, you mentioned now it's an independent organization. How do you position Foxconn in the MIH and EV industry based on a known good leader of the electronic contract manufacturer? Yeah, uh, you know, Hong Hai you know, is positioned as one of the members of the MIH Alliance. You know, we are the founding member of the MIH. And uh, we uh, will provide or we will share our rolling, rolling chassis platform and the, the software platform as well you know, with, uh, with the members of the MIH uh, 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 Alliance. And we also will provide uh, 
the MIH members with more business opportunities. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the, the car manufacturers with more choices in the supply chains. You know, in the past, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, suppliers for the uh, auto industries, they had to go through this tier one, tier two, tier mm -hmm. three structure in order to reach the OEMs. But with MIH, hopefully, you know, we will bring the, the, the distance between the OEM and the suppliers much closer. You know, that way, you know, uh, that will make the uh, supply chain uh, more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. More efficient in such a way that so that the development cost and time, and we call it TTM, time to market, and uh, TTC, total uh, time to cost, will become shorter and uh, lower. Yeah, that's our, our, our goal. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we also have an audience over here. Uh, uh, this person wanted to ask, what do you mean non-transparent semiconductor supply chain? Semiconductor supply chain network has been existed for several decades for main semiconductor factories like TSMC and Intel. Yeah, uh, uh, with that non-transparency, I mean uh, for the uh, auto industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the auto industries, because it has to go through this tier one, tier two, tier three type of supply chains. You know, the auto, uh, the auto OEMs, they work with tier one companies. And uh, tier one, then you know, uh, uh, you know, use the tier two or tier three components to fulfill, uh, to, pro uh, to, to provide to the OEM the, the solutions. So on the OEM, uh, auto uh, OEMs for a view, the semiconductor supply chain is non-transparent because it was hidden behind uh, uh, tier one companies. That's what we mean. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, look at uh, 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 Tesla, no, they changed it. They work directly with TSMC, you know, with their you know, uh, to to have their own ICs, and then they take the ICs and give it to uh, some uh, tier one companies to use. So, you know, that's what we see, you know, it will change, you know, what will happen in the auto industry. That's also very exciting as well. Yeah, to yeah. see all the changes in the future. Um, for another audience here uh, to ask, so TSMC's uh, founder, Maurice Chan, recently stated that the 50 billion incentives from the recent chips Act will not be enough to simulate U.S. domestic semiconductor manufacturing. Do you agree? And what type of size of investment would would that be? I know a lot of TSMC questions today. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, to build a factory is not the factory itself, but also the uh, uh, the infrastructure. You know, without the infrastructure, the factory itself will not be able to, you know. Uh, to 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 perform, so um, and also because you know the supply chain uh, uh, is something. If there's not enough volume there, it will be very very costly. So uh, the overall uh, cost to build a fab in places like that may cost you know. But we had a, 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 a factory in Wisconsin. You know, we thought you know, the building, uh, the extra cost for building a fab there is about 30% uh, uh, you know, higher than uh, in, uh, in, in, in China. But end up being, no, it's not that. It's much higher, mm -hmm. okay, because the infrastructure. So um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, the cost, the overall cost will be much higher. You know, I heard uh, someone from uh, on the news that uh, uh, 
that uh, it's about double instead of uh, instead of uh, you know, 30 40 percent higher mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so more question on and curious on the mih platform what do you see as possibilities of integrating the strengths of silicon valley in taiwan especially the innovation and manufacturing capability to enhance foscom mih platform yeah, I, I I would not use Foscon in my H platform. It's an open platform. I hope uh, you know, <laughs> it's not uh, Foscon's in my edge. No, I, I would say the interaction between Silicon Valley and the Taiwan industry has been always very intensive. You know, so uh, I would uh, suggest you know, this, uh, our friends in Silicon Valley you know, take serious look uh, into this MIH platform. I, I live in uh, the States for about 20 years. I also lived in Silicon Valley for about eight years. And uh, there, you know, I know uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, ICT companies trying to get into the auto industry, but uh, was not successful. You know, by looking further into it, it's partly because the ICT industry players, they know very little about the chassis. You know, the, the, the characteristic or the, uh, uh, the function of the chassis, rolling chassis, uh, is that is unfamiliar to them. You know, it's mostly controlled by the, uh, the uh, automakers, but with the uh, MIH, we open it up. So any ICT players, you know, they have this, you know, smart AI technologies that they want to apply to the, uh, to the car, which is the future, by the way, you know, software defined uh, vehicle would be the future. But with the software, with the ICs, but you want to define the vehicles, you have to have the access or know the, uh, the, the vehicles. MIH plus, uh, 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 provides that kind of a, a, a knowledge and platforms for the ICT players to participate. So with that, I encourage you know, the, uh, our friends in Silicon Valley to take a serious look at uh, our MIH, what we offer there. You will be, you know, uh, you will be uh, uh, surprised that there are many things that you don't know about is there that can be used for your product. Okay. I, I'm glad I'm in, I'm in facing New York, but I will let the Silicon Valley people know that they should think about that and be aware of that. So um, our you. last questions, I know you're, we're almost falling uh, out of time, but last question. So we know Foxconn has been deploying robotics and automation technologies for the future uh, of smart manufacturing in human-less factories or so-called industry 4.0. How do you think the impact of advanced technology today in the manufacturing fact, uh, industries? Yeah, I think uh, recently we announced that uh, you know, we have uh, three or four uh, WEF uh, uh, certified lighthouse factories. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with that, you know, it tells you that, uh, you know, our uh, advanced uh, manufacturing that can really, you know, achieve the OEE, you know, goal to improve the manufacturing uh, performance. And the, the technology that we use in the, uh, the lighthouse uh, factories, uh, that includes all of, uh, uh, sense various sensors and, uh, 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 and the software that's needed to utilize those sensors to make it uh, uh, useful for the uh, manufact uh, for people to run the manufacturer to to run the uh, manufacturers and uh, uh, with that um, I would say you know, if you look at the uh, 
uh, EV industry is highly automated because you know uh, the 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 car is big and uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's very complicated. Uh, so without smart manufacturing, uh, it's going to be very very difficult. You don't want your car. The car you're driving you know, will lose some you know, uh, screws here and there from time to time, right? And you know how many schools are there, you know, for a car. So you need to have something that is smart enough and uh, can do it, you know, uh, with the precision and uh, uh, with no uh, human uh, introduced errors. And we think the uh, uh, smart manufacturing or the industry 4.0 technology is way to go. Okay, and especially going. Uh, to uh, going for the EV era, the com uh, the the complexity of the car it bec is becoming more and more. Then you need more advanced uh, uh, manufacturing technology to, to guarantee the quality of the pro uh, of the EVs, and that's what we see. All right, I I ha I got a lot of like, notification over here, so a little bit sidetracked. But I promise you, this is the last question because a lot of people <laughs> about EV. So it's about EV um automotive battery. So the question is, while Honghai is automotive battery market, will Honghai consider to build more battery fabs in other countries to closer uh to auto companies as part of the supply chain? Uh, okay, I think uh, batteries uh, for EV are very essential. You know, it accounts for like 30% of the overall cost. And also the minerals of the, uh, of the uh, 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 batteries are you know, hard to come by. You know, sometimes it's, you know, it's scales uh, in a certain way. And the technology also is growing rapidly. You, know, uh, you have... Uh, the, the LFP type or solid state type uh, by uh, uh, by increasing the performance of the uh -huh. anode or the cathode that will increase the capacity of the of the of, of the battery. So uh, FOSCA work uh, worked on this uh, uh, battery technologies uh, internally. You now uh, we have uh, labs. Uh, in Taiwan, and also we uh, work uh, with, we invested in a number of companies in the States also, you know, that, like SES just recently announced that they have a very uh, 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 you know, uh, high capacity uh, energy density uh, battery cell recently announced. So uh, those, I think, uh, is as I said, it's very, very essential for the EVs. And we have to have uh, 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 a way to uh, not only participate, but to add value to it. And I encourage uh, uh, our friends on the line, you know, really look into that opportunities. And I think there's still you know, a long way to go. But there, Big opportunity in the uh, in the uh, 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 batteries for the for the EVs. You know, let's do it together. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That that yeah, you answer every question, and then people also curious about the Taiwan's perspective. You touch on based on that. Thank you very much, Yang Liu. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank your time today. Yeah. So it's still virtual clapping. <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you. Have thank a you. good day. Thank you. So next, uh, moving on next, let me share my slide over here. <laughs> okay. So everyone see my slide. All right. So now moving on, we have Jimmy Gurich, VP of Semiconductor Industry Association, short for SIA. Jimmy leads SIA's global policy team and works to advance SIA international competitiveness 
trade, supply chain, and China policy agenda. Today, Jimmy will talk about strengthening the global semiconductor supply chain. So, Jimmy, are you there? Hi, good morning, good evening, how are you? Good, good, thank you. Let me excellent. start sharing and then you can share your screen right away. Oh, excellent, all right. I'll pull my slides up and then we'll begin. All right, thank you. All right, are we able to see that? Yes, we can. Uh, you probably need to do the present mode. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> one second. <laughs> All right, can you see that? Yes, looks awesome, thank you. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Alice, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here for uh, Natia's event um, this evening on the US-Taiwan High Tech Forum. We are uh, really excited to have the opportunity to share some of our thoughts about the global semiconductor supply chain. I listened to Mr. Young's presentation previously, and he obviously touched upon a number of really fascinating dynamics in our industry. I'm going to start at a little bit of a higher level about the semiconductor industry, some of the key policy developments, and then how the U.S. and Taiwan fit in that supply chain, and then what the U.S. is doing in terms of semiconductor industrial policy to help promote uh, the industry ecosystem here in the United States. I'm the Vice President for Global Policy at SIA. I lead all of our international work, and again, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So just really briefly, who is SIA? The Semiconductor Industry Association, we are a nonprofit uh, industry oriented trade association based out of Washington, D.C. Collectively, we represent two thirds of the global semiconductor ecosystem by revenue and 98 percent of U.S. headquartered semiconductor industry firms. Uh, the top category are the charter members that we represent large to small. And of course, many key players from Taiwan, including MediaTek and TSMC, are also important and influential members at the Semiconductor Industry Association. Just a little bit about our industry here in the United States. While the semiconductor industry is inherently global, uh, it is around a $460 billion global industry. It's the fourth most traded good period, $1.7 trillion in international trade in 2019. From the United States perspective, the semiconductor industry, while we invented it, we uh, still have a significant um, uh, place across the value chain. In fact, today, uh, half of U.S. semiconductor manufacturing firms have their capacity located in the United States. Semiconductors are still the fourth largest export out of the United States after aircraft, refined oil, and crude oil, although exports of semiconductors in the U.S. are around $20 billion annually, I think, exports from Taiwan internationally are well over 100 billion. And that just shows you the scale of the manufacturing now that's happening in Taiwan, which is amazing. Uh, and about one fifth of revenue for semiconductor companies headquartered in the United States uh, is plowed back into research development. Around 277,000 engineers and employees are directly um, employed by the semiconductor industry here. And U.S. companies uh, account for around half of the global market in terms of semiconductor chip sales. Uh, but more importantly, I think as our last speaker touched upon, semiconductor devices are really ubiquitous in our economy. Everything digital that we use today from uh, solutions for energy efficiency, like a, a power controller and a solar panel for 5G communications, the radio frequency devices in your base station, to the microcontrollers and robotics, to uh, consumer electronics, AI, even in national security and healthcare, everything is dependent on advances in computing power and, and semiconductor technology. One second here. Um, and another really key aspect of our industry is that we have deep global supply chains. There's really no one company or country that's able to dominate all aspects of the supply chain on their own. It's just not possible in today's globalized world. In fact, there's more than 50 points across the supply chain where only one or three companies are the key suppliers, whether it's in the design space, for example, advanced processors or front end manufacturing, particularly at the leading edge, some of the EDA technologies and core software, equipment and materials. 
Uh, and it's really only a couple of key countries in the supply chain, US, uh, China, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Europe, and UK that are play, play prominent roles uh, across our uh, semiconductor supply chain. Um, just focusing in a little bit more in terms of detail as to where, where do the United States and Taiwan sit in this global semiconductor value chain. So if you look in the dark blue, that's the US uh, percentage of the total value add by segment of the semiconductor industry. Remember, we have the software, the design segment, uh, the logic, analog memory chips, and then manufacturing in terms of front and back end and equipment and materials. US is obviously uh, has a leading position in the core IP software, logic, and analog chips. Um, and is still relatively strong in manufacturing equipment with about 41% of, of the market. But uh, where Taiwan sits and plays a very strong role, of course, is in uh, the materials uh, front end and back end fabrication. And it's really a strong interdependence that the US and Taiwan has. US is able to specialize in the highly value add segments of the IP and R&D intensive design. And then there, and Taiwan is able to specialize in high volume custom and advanced uh, foundry chip production. And it's really the symbiotic relationship that allows both of our industries to grow and succeed. In fact, since 2000, uh, total Taiwanese foundry revenue from North American customers is around $310 billion of total revenue. So that's a massive amount of revenue that Taiwanese companies have received from US design and fabulous companies that have been able to reinvest into research development, their workforce, capital expenditures. It's a massive amount. Um, and that just speaks volumes to the important relationship that Taiwan today plays in our so global semiconductor value chain. Um, we've had a lot of success with our globalized supply chains. Again, no one company or country is able to do everything on their own. But today, our supply chains and our ecosystem is facing um, unprecedented challenges. There are geopolitical tensions, um, trade restrictions, increasing techno-nationalism. There's organic industry challenges relating to the rising cost of manufacturing and design innovation. Today, it costs over a half a billion dollars to design a five nanometer device. On the manufacturing side of things, the cost to build a brand new three nanometer logic foundry astronomical 20 to 30 billion dollars over a 10 year period. Uh, governments are now stepping up their pace of investment in this sector. China, of course, um, investing heavily to catch up in the semiconductor industry. Um, and uh, Chinese firms as well, in fact, in 2019 outpaced Taiwanese firms in terms of their share of the global fabulous semiconductor market share. So we have a lot of challenges on the horizon for our industry. And what we believe is we need deeper global collaboration in order to solve these, uh, including with United States, Taiwan, all key players to ensure we have a healthy and open semiconductor ecosystem. Just a little bit further here, obviously Taiwan, um, uh, sorry, China is a really key issue that you know the US is closely following. First and foremost, China is still the largest market for semiconductor companies globally. In fact, around 34.4% of global semiconductor revenue is derived from China-based shipments. And of course, that includes multinational company supply chains in China. Um, but China is still the world's largest hub for electronic device assembly. Um, on the other hand, China obviously has its own goals to become self-sufficient in semiconductor technology, a very um, aspirational goal likely to be unmet anytime soon but still they're investing massive sums to achieve that in fact um over 190 billion dollars in uh investments in over 110 new fabs have been announced since 2014. an incredible amount some are moving to bankruptcy and not doing as successful as others but overall we believe china's share of manufacturing is going to increase significantly and then finally, on the design side, we see um, a significant increase in revenue by Chinese firms. In fact, around 20, 30% compound annual growth of China's design sector last year with over uh, 20,000 new companies registered within China to enter into the semiconductor space. A really phenomenal number that I think in five to 10 years is gonna be a significant force to reckon with. So 
Well, how does the industry respond to a lot of these challenges in terms of geopolitical tensions, in terms of trade frictions, in terms of um, organic challenges to our workforce and research development? So um, I could talk a little bit about what we're doing in terms of the Semiconductor Industry Association here in Washington, D.C. Well, we believe it's essential to strengthen the U.S. semiconductor manufacturing base to increase its resiliency. And I'll talk about it. There's a perception that the U.S. is trying to be self-sufficient in semiconductors, trying to reshore supply chains. That is absolutely false. The United States does not have that goal. And I'll talk a little bit later about what exactly we're trying to pursue. It's actually impossible for any one country, again, to be self-sufficient. And even for the United States, it's an impossible goal that'll never be met. Um, we, we're also focusing on double down on, uh, on chip design and research leadership and thinking about how do we uh, maintain access to global markets while also balancing national security concerns that governments have in the industry today. Uh, so in terms of the manufacturing base, this is a really high level U.S. government focus. In fact, this is President uh, Biden himself holding a, a DRAM device in his hand produced just outside of um, uh, Washington, C in Virginia, talking about how these chips it, are critical infrastructure for the future. And then you've got the Secretary of Commerce, key members of Congress who've come together uh, partly due to COVID-19, partly due to tensions of China, partly due to the global semiconductor shortage to um, initiate new industrial policy to support a revitalization of the semiconductor manufacturing base here in the United States. Now, there's a lot of detail on this chart, but essentially the key reason why the United States has seen an erosion in their semiconductor manufacturing base has been a loss of its competitiveness from an investment environment. In 1990, the United States had 30% of installed global wafer capacity, and today that's declined to just 12%. Uh, one of the key differentiating, one of the key factors for that decline has been, of course, uh, increased labor costs in the U.S., but more importantly, a major factor that's driving the cost differential between building fabs in the U.S. versus East Asia is government incentives. Uh, the U.S. lacks a national policy for the microelectronics industry. It doesn't have specialized tax breaks or government grants. Um, and actually, we did a study with the Boston Consulting Group that found that um, the U.S. is about uh, uh, 28 to 70 percent more expensive, depending on the country, to build and operate a fab, much like the previous speaker was talking about his experience in building factories in Wisconsin. We just don't have the level of support from government that other nations like Singapore, Israel, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea offer to their nations, uh, to their firms. So uh, thankfully, the U.S. Uh, Congress, the Senate, uh, this year passed on a bipartisan basis the United States um, uh, Innovation and Competitiveness Act that included a provision called the CHIPS Act um, that includes $52 billion for domestic semiconductor um, industry support including two main portions, one on manufacturing and two on second on research. Manufacturing is focused on um, front end three 200 millimeter manufacturing sites, um, around $39 billion to spur more onshore manufacturing. And there's about $12 billion for research development funds, including the establishment of a national semiconductor technology center. Um, and this is just outlining the different provisions, who's responsible for different aspects of the program, the Department of Commerce in the U.S. is going to have the primary authority to delegate a lot of these grants. But this bill, uh, for example, is still awaiting final um, uh, approval. In the U.S., we have our bills first um, uh, drafted by the Senate, uh, then uh, debated in the House, and then sent to the president for approval. It's passed the Senate. It still has not passed the House. So the House of Representatives in the United States has yet to vote on this bill and has not yet been funded. So right now, the $52 billion is just a nice idea. It has not been funded. We hope by the end of this year, however, that the House is going to pass this and this funding will be available. And to get to the earlier point that I mentioned, I know there's reporting, there's been statements out there that the U.S. is trying to completely reshore supply chains and be self-sufficient. That was never the goal of the CHIPS Act, and it never will be. The goal for the U.S. is simply to have a more competitive business environment, to attract more investment, to have a more resilient supply chain. So, for example, in some areas like advanced logic foundry capacity or 
advanced packaging. The U.S. has 0% of global supply. And our hope is through the CHIPS Act and these type of investments, the U.S. might have 5 15% of maybe 7% of global supply. No one in the United States has the false dream of trying to have 100% of manufacturing capacity or rebuilding supply chains on their own shores. So this is not a threat to other players in the global supply chain. In fact, the U.S. is open to international investors and is welcoming to companies from Taiwan, from South Korea, Japan, to build and operate fabs and qualify for many of these incentives under the CHIPS Act. So in terms of research and design leadership, we also think this is very important that the U.S. should not just be focused on uh, its manufacturing base. It should also be thinking about how do we strengthen our lead in semiconductor design. Uh, we have a number of challenges. While the U.S. accounts for around 62 percent of the global fabulous market, we have a serious shortage of engineers who are able to work as design engineers in the semiconductor industry. The federal government is not keeping pace with the private sector in terms of investment into semiconductor relevant um, uh, research at universities and labs. Uh, China, for example, is, as I mentioned previously, rapidly um, advancing in the fabulous space. And then IP theft is a major issue that um, potentially hampers investment and innovation in our sector. Um, and this is just a little bit of a, a further snapshot of how the U.S. overall investment in research development has stagnated. Uh, the U.S. used to lead the way. Now other countries are growing uh, much more significantly, particularly in fields like materials science, computer science, uh, applied mathematics, those that are really relevant for the semiconductor industry. So uh, the CHIPS Act thankfully included some provisions that are going to support the design ecosystem and research development like a National Semiconductor Technology Center, much like a national lab, like a Yichri Gongye Yuan or a IMEC for the semiconductor industry in the United States. There's increase in funding for the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation. But one thing we think is really necessary is an investment tax credit so that for all your design expenditures incurred in the United States, we believe companies should get a 25% tax credit for that activity. And this is something actually that's being debated right now in the US Congress. The investment tax credit actually is very likely for manufacturing. There's still a debate as to whether or not that should um, also apply to design activity. We believe it should, and we're gonna continue to push that. Uh, in terms of workforce, um, you know, the US has a really significant challenge. And there's really two fold, uh, two aspects of that challenge. One is uh, the U.S. from a domestic pipeline simply doesn't have enough K through 12 students interested in STEM degrees. Um, most want to go into sports medicine or uh, film or, you know, um, music production stuff or, you know, gaming app development. That's the really hot degrees right now. Um, and it's hard to attract young Americans to study the key degrees that are relevant for electrical engineering and the semiconductor industry. And then another, you know, because of that, um, we have a high degree of uh, foreign nationals that come to the U.S. that study, but unfortunately, the U.S. immigration system doesn't always make it easy for those engineers to stay here. So we think there needs to be a heavy investment in both our K through 12 education, but also a um, greater willingness to allow more foreign-born talent to stay in the United States and innovate here and be part of the global innovation ecosystem with U.S. and other universities together. Um, and just finally, in terms of trade, and uh, before I get uh, here to the Q&A, um, one thing that's really important is that access to global markets is what um, strengthens the U.S. and other players in the semiconductor industry. In fact, the U.S. semiconductor industry has, it has half of the global market share for semiconductor sales with a higher R&D intensity. That means that U.S. semiconductor companies are in this virtuous cycle of having higher scale, higher R&D intensity that leads to U.S. technology leadership. Um, and this is really contingent upon U.S. and other global semiconductor firms having access to markets. 80% of all semiconductor sales for U.S. semiconductor companies are to those located outside of the United States. Uh, and our markets are deeply global. As I mentioned, $1.7 trillion in global trade, the fourth most traded good. In fact, free trade has been fantastic for our industry. The WTO Information Technology Agreement, which brought tariffs down on semiconductors and electronics products to zero in 1997 and expanded in 2015, 
has enabled 20% of growth in all trade of semiconductors. So this is really, I think, a no-brainer. International trade, open markets, globalization have been uh, massive um, wins for our industry. Um, but there are real challenges on the horizon as the U.S. and China are increasingly headed into um, a more adversarial relationship. Obviously, Taiwan is central to that. Uh, and is an issue that's top of mind of policymakers here in the U.S. Uh, there's an increasing uh, um, uh, movement in Washington by some of the more hawkish policymakers to impose more controls on semiconductor technology. And while that's going to be necessary to protect national security, we hope that uh, they can be done in partnership with allies and more narrowly tailored to help mitigate negative impact on innovation and the industrial base. So with that, I'll close my official part of the presentation, uh, and I look forward to Q&A with participants on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, that was really fantastic. I was taking notes, and thank you for pointing out some challenges and giving us some like background on the uh, foreign talent and, uh, and, and so many. So we have a question here for you. Um, what suggestion would you have for Taiwan to stay relevant and competitive in the future of semiconductor and supply chain industry with the rise of China in the industry with more than 100 new fab projects, committed investment of 196 uh, billion? And yeah, so what's your point? Uh, what's your uh, perspective on this? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, uh, I've spent a lot of time visiting both Taiwan and mainland China. Um, before the pandemic, I would be in uh, China about six, eight times out of the year, or Taiwan two, three times. Um, and one thing that was really interesting, I think talent is really important. And Taiwan has to keep a laser focus on ensuring that the talent stays with Taiwanese companies and uh, helps to promote innovation there. Um, for example, I visited one big Chinese new state-owned semiconductor manufacturing company in eastern China, uh, and they had 690 Taiwanese engineers working for them uh, that every Monday took the Taipei to eastern China flight, and then every Friday took the, type, the flight back to Taipei. Um, so I think this is a real issue for uh, the, the Taiwanese semiconductor industry is what does it do about its workforce? How does it make working in Taiwan more attractive? How does it um help uh you know with benefits with training with um educational opportunities to ensure the talent stays in taiwan and the ip is protected mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and then you also mentioned about like the uh investment part so um so more venture capitals uh, uh do you think that like sorry i'm like revising there's a revising question over here um so for um for the more venture capital investment for new semiconductor, like do you think that uh, there should be more venture capital investment to the new uh, semiconductor companies, both in um, in Taiwan or China and the U.S. Because I know U.S. now if they're putting a lot of money to doing the educational program. Rex, is that the question that that you that addressed? No, that's a great question. So. Um... You know, in terms of venture capital, traditionally, the semiconductor industry has basically had a uh, shortage issue with just not enough VC co money coming into the industry. However, over the last two years, I think there's been um, a bit of a reinvigoration of investment, particularly in artificial intelligence. Um, and the shortage has really highlighted the importance of this industry. And so we're seeing, we're seeing uh, VC investment rounds increase. Although a lot of that, again, is in China. Um, but, you know, I think overall the increase in VC activity to our industry is a good thing. But there's never enough. We're always hearing about startups that couldn't get funding, had to go under, and they had good promising technology. I think part of it, too, is that the awareness of the VC industry, of our industry, business model is very low. Many VC funds want to invest in a quick return industry like internet gaming or, you know, e-commerce and delivery services, real estate, you know, digital healthcare, kind of the app economy is much more interesting for the VC community. So, you know, to have a semiconductor startup CEO tell a VC, you know, we're going to make a return in like seven years. It's just not very promising for a lot of VC funds. Um, so I think we need to think about, you know, how do we try and nurture this 
ecosystem through uh, things like collaboration with government research institutes and universities. I, I'm laughing because uh, um, I, I work for a, a company that is doing the uh, tile, uh, talent resource. And, and we do have a lot of clients right now that is real estate. You just mentioned e-commerce delivery. So like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're looking for talents everywhere right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, in your um, perspective, what are some opportunities that you see Taiwan and the U.S. semiconductor industry can collaborate in the future? Are there opportunities for the new ventures like startups, mm -hmm. VC capital investment, or what other stuff? That's a great question. So I think there's um, we're probably moving into an era of um, new cooperation, expanded cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan. As I mentioned, the U.S. and Taiwan are already collaborating every day, every hour, every second in the industry. The U.S. fabulous industry wouldn't work without its collaboration with the Taiwanese foundry sector. So that collaboration is already there. But now we see, for example, that U.S. companies are increasing their investment in Taiwan, um, like Micron Technology, one of the largest foreign direct investors in Taiwan. Uh, you've got Intel that recently just uh, did a small deal with a Taiwanese semiconductor firm. Uh, and then Taiwanese companies also coming to the United States, TSMC building a $15 billion fab in Arizona. Um, that's going to bring TSMC supply chain opportunities for materials, equipment, uh, fab construction services. So I think overall, there are a lot of opportunities that are just going to increase uh, for both of our uh, countries across the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, once the pandemic um, and global trade tension, how should the semiconductor ecosystem readjust and corresponding the manufacturing op operations and supply chains in this new normal? Yeah, I think the new normal really is going to be a focus on resiliency, not self-sufficiency. Again, self-sufficiency is a dead-end road. It's not going to work for anyone, but we can be more resilient. Uh, and that means having a little bit more onshore supply. So, for example, um, you know, in terms of the U.S., there's a focus on a leading edge logic. I know Europe is looking at increasing its share of production. So is Japan. And, you know, I don't think that's going to uh, be damaging to Taiwan. Taiwan is always going to be the hub for the semiconductor foundry sector, the OSAT sector. That's not going to change. I just think we're going to see diversif diversification of those supply chains across more geographies, which is is good for the industry. More geographic diversity is going to bring more stability. I mean, one cannot help but notice the droughts in Taiwan, um, the power shortages due to the shutdown of the nuclear power plants. Those have impacted the manufacturing sector, and that's a concern for you know customers that access some of the Taiwanese manufacturing facilities. Mm -hmm. And we have some audience um, uh, asking regarding uh, SIA. So what is SIA proposing or lobbying in response to IP uh, thief issue? No, that is a really serious issue. So, you know, we think that intellectual property is the lifeblood of our industry without IP, without our engineering talent, our industry would not um, exist. Um, you know, frankly, a lot of that's going to um, come down to the governments. This is where the governments have to work through law enforcement, their judicial branch um, to step up um, investigations. We think governments should be investing more resources in their um, law enforcement to understand our sector. Oftentimes, many of the uh, uh, courts and many of the um, uh, you know law enforcement agents don't understand our industry. And so they don't even know how to assist companies in, in intellectual property cases. So, um, you know, we think um, there's a lot that could be done there. Um, and ultimately, the bad actors need to be punished. So when a company is caught stealing technology, they should be prosecuted. And a good example, actually, of a U.S.-Taiwan collaboration in this space is several years ago, a major uh, Chinese state-owned enterprise stole technology from a U.S. company based in Taiwan. And the U.S. and the Taiwanese prosecutors work together uh, to indict that company and restrict them from further expanding their manufacturing presence. So there's also cases where the U.S. and Taiwan have collaborated very well uh, to protect IP. And I, I've seen as well that the prosecutors in Taiwan have been stepping up significantly raids and investigations into companies that might be engaging in illicit activity. And that's what the governments need to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thank you. 
And uh, we also have an audience here to ask uh, how are semiconductor firms looking to mitigate political risk? I see supply chain globalization does not seem to be in the minds or on many policy makers in both China and the US. Yeah, I mean, the key word is uh, diversification and resiliency. Uh, I think a lot of companies are thinking about, you know, how do I uh, have a second and third source supplier strategy? What is my inventory that I need to have to ride out some of these supply chain disruptions? And also, you know, the reality is that every semiconductor firm is global. Their customer base is global. Their supply chains are global. And governments are going to have a wish of techno-nationalism and sovereign borders, but that's not the reality. And um, there's a little bit of pressure between the companies and governments where we have to walk a fine line and keep everybody happy. So one thing you might do in the United States might make someone in Beijing very unhappy. Something you might do in Beijing might make Washington very unhappy. So the key challenge is how to walk that balance beam for uh, these multinational companies. It's not easy, but I've seen some do it very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another SI uh, question. So SI has been uh, the main influencer for the uh, in calling the attention of the U.S. administrations for rebuilding the massive semiconductor manufacturing capacities in America. Now with TSMC, Samsung and Intel all starting to build new factories in the U.S. In what way can Asian IC uh, related companies work closely with the U.S. to support innovation and help rebalance the over-title manufacturing distribution. Yeah, again, I think the, the single fact that TSMC and Samsung are considering uh, and have been in, in announcing new investment expansions um, already validates that there's a way that U.S. and Asian and East Asian companies can work together. Um, I think we're going to see more uh, companies from Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Japan announce investment plans in the United States. Likewise, we're seeing more announcements from U.S. companies in Asia. Uh, Global Foundries is expanding in Singapore. Uh, Western Digital is expanding with Kyosha in Japan. Micron expanding uh, in other regions. Um, so I think this is, again, it's a global supply chain and everyone's going to benefit from more investment, irregardless as, as to where it happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that's all the question. I know time it's up and we do have more questions coming in. We'll I see there's a lot of uh, the really, really interesting questions in the chat. I wish if I had more time, I, I'd answer all of them. <laughs> or you can pick pick one. I'll, I'll let you pick one and then you answer only one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say, yeah, there are there are some people that have been saying the U.S. is trying to, you know, build indigenous supply chains and and. And, you know, again, we're not trying to do that. Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, don't count out the United States. Um, you know, the U.S. has um, still really energetic engineering talent, the world's best universities. Um, just look at the amazing innovation that's happening with uh, SpaceX um, sending, sending uh, you know, astronauts into space on a commercial basis and a high reuse, reusability ratio leading the charge in electric vehicles and autonomous driving. I mean, there's amazing engineering talent here. So I wouldn't count out the U.S. innovation and industrial base. And so I think it's an opportunity. In fact, we see many Taiwanese companies invest in the U.S. because of the workforce, um, investing here to expand access to R&D talent, to engage with U.S. universities. So the U.S. has its strengths. We have our weaknesses, just like every other economy in the, in the global system. Yeah, thank you. Thank me. Thank you, Jimmy Greenwich. Yeah, thank you for today. So uh, let me share. Thank my... you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen again to welcome our uh, hold on a second. Mm. So welcome our next guest. But my screen is not uh, where I can just announce it because Brian's here waiting for a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't pull off the screen in time, but I would like to introduce you properly. Yeah, so coming next, we have Brian Schiff, Group VP and GM of Display and Flexible Technology Applied Materials. Dr. Brian Shi is an attack technologist and experience in semiconductor, solo and display. So Dr. Brian Shi will give us uh, insight on display technology trends and implication to semi industries. So welcome, welcome, uh, Dr. Xi. 
Good. Uh, thank you, Alice. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me share my prison. So, can you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Now we can see it. Mm -hmm. So can you see it now? Uh, yes, and you can present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, thank good. you. Okay, take it away. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, good morning and a good afternoon or good evening. Uh, I'm Brian Xie, in charge of the display and the flexible technology business unit at Applied Materials. Uh, in next 25 minutes, I will share with you our view on display technology trend and also its implication to a semiconductor uh, industry. This presentation contains a forward-looking statement. Uh, it means risk and uncertainty. Uh, so we assume no obligation to update this um, once our information changes. Thank you. This is the agenda of my presentation today. Uh, before I present, uh, please allow me to quickly introduce my company, Applied Materials, and my business unit, DFT, Display and Flexible Technology. Thank you. A prime material was founded in 1967, now the 54 years old. We are the number one semiconductor and the display manufacturing equipment company. And we are continuing to grow. I want to thank our customers, our vendors, and our employees uh, if you are here today. We have three segments, semiconductor, display, and the service. My business unit, uh, DFT, uh, or somebody calls AKT, was founded in 1991. Our major R&D locations are in Silicon Valley, Germany, and Taiwan. Actually, Taiwan is our manufacturing base. There are some similarities between semiconductor industry trend and the display industry trend that I would like to discuss here. Through the history of a semiconductor from 1960 through the mid-80s, we saw a period of the rapid wafer size changes and the relatively slower changes in device, process, and the materials. After the mid-80s, the wafer size changes were less frequent but the process and device change and the complexity dramatically increased to enable higher performance IC with the smaller design rules. Ever since the device design rules approach one micron, there has been rapidly adoption of new materials, process, and device structure. We see the display industry following a similar pattern. In the early years, display substrate, the glasses, the scaling was the focus with relatively incremental changes in the underlying process and the materials. For the past 10 years also, the rapid substrate scaling has been replaced by innovation in materials, process, and device technology to enable higher resolution and other new capability in display. Smaller design rules, along with the adoption of copper technology, metal oxide transistor, low temperature poly silicon transistor, OLED, quantum dot, etc., require new process new materials innovation 
and also new yield management methodology. For many of these innovation display and learn from the experience of the semiconductor industry. It was why we applied materials entered this adjacent market display by leveraging our core competence from semiconductor. Later, you will see in this presentation, in addition to technology trend similarity, display also has impact on the semiconductor business. Display a uh, technology trend. I would like to start with our vision of the display industry. The amount and the variety of information available to us is growing geometrically, and the humans crave this information. Humans are visual creatures. We like to see things. Display is the window between humans and the faster growing information universe. Therefore, humans demand better and better display. It drives the display technology roadmap. Last 20 years is the LCD era. The key technology trend was scaling up LCD manufacturing onto bigger and the bigger glass substrate, so-called generations. Today, we are in the generation 10.5, or people call Gen 11. This enables the larger LCD products, notebook to monitors to TVs, and lower the cost per area. With the introduction of smartphone around 2007, the innovation focus shift from substrate scale up to performance, like a semi. Higher resolution, multi-touch capability, thinner, lighter, less power consumption, especially for smartphone. More recently, the display industry moves from LCD to OLED for better visual performance and form factor such as flexible display, foldable display. I started with OLED mobile devices like smartphone and watch. And the display panel revenue per year increased eight times in the last 20 years. Now the OLED wave moving to the IT and the TV segment. We also see the VR AR micro LED display are on the horizon. We live in a 3D world. Humans will not be satisfied with 2D display, two-dimension display, no matter how much we improve the panel resolution, like a 2K TV to 4K TV to 8K TV, even to 16K TV. In the longer, in the longer term, but the industry will introduce true natural 3D displays. All these new advanced displays will drive refreshed demand, new demand, and more semiconductor content. How is this impact to the semiconductor industry? Let us see what happened in the last few years and what is happening now. This is an example of how display technology drives smartphone business, which has become an important part of a semiconductor business. For example, last year, 2020, more than half of the semiconductor manufacturing investment is for smartphone. Semiconductor content keeps increasing in the newer display devices. Here are more specific examples of smartphone and the gaming notebook. 
we can see the semiconductor content keep increasing. In the future, we see the new display technology in form factor, AR, VR, the MR, micro LED display, and the natural 3D display. All of this will further increase demand and the semiconductor content. Let's start with the form factor. Display form factors from the rigid to flexible, foldable, rollable, stretchable. All this will stimulate the demand, the refresh the demand to benefit both display and the semiconductor uh, industry. AR, VR, We strongly believe AR VR definitely will have a big impact on humans' life and also the semiconductor uh, industry. But it might not be help display business that much uh, because you can see all these display panel size of VR, AR, MR are very small. And we display industry prefer the size of the display panel. So for another one is the micro LED. Micro LED has the incredible performance potential entitled to exceed both OLED and LCD displays. But still has many technical and cost challenge to realize the potential, especially in cost. And EU. We think the micro LED will start with wearable display and a very large public display first. To solve the micro LED technical challenge, semiconductor like buses are the foundation. For example, sidewall preservation optimized light extraction, reliable mass transfer, testability, extreme uniformity, reduce the, L, the LED die size for both cost and more room for pixel level sensors and other non-display functions. Semiconductor-like technology will be a foundation to help solve this micro LED a technical issue and even the cost issue. As I mentioned earlier, if we can shrink the LED die size to create more room in a pixel level for more embedded devices to make the display much smarter with the motive functions such as the biometrics and the micro LED display will revolutionize the human lives. 3D display, natural 3D display. People might say 3D display failed in the past. Uh, yes, but that only shows it was not done right. And we did not have the right technology to solve the problems. The 3D we see in the everyday life is created by many different cues. That brain combine those cues together to give the natural 3D. For a display to show a natural 3D image, all these cues must be consistent. But the previous, the failed 3D technology only used binocular disparity left eye and the right eye see two different perspectives with glasses to create the 3D effect. It was far away from enough. Then of course, it failed. There are three candidate technology to create natural 3D. Holography, 
very focal and light field display. Everything our eye sees is a light field. Humans are very good at capturing multiple angular rays from each point in space using each eye. To do it, there are two approaches. One is the multifocal planks and uh, multi-views. The holography technology, very focal technology, and uh, multifocal light field displays are more suitable for near-eye applications, like the VR, AR. For large area display, the resolution, which gives an image exactly recreating what we see in the real world, like a color, position, direction information, is the multi-view light field display. As I just point out, display people like large area display. Therefore, I would like to discuss the impact of the multi the multi-view light field display on the display technology roadmap and implications to the semiconductor industry. The multi-view light field display approach is multiple views are created for each frame and project it in the space so that our eye capture more than one view. The additional angular perspective of views create a light field and hence the nature 3D image. Therefore, if we can have more views, then the image quality will be better. This chart shows how the uh, increasing number of views will drive display panel resolution requirement. If we compare today's a 2D display to a 3D light field display with a 25, 100, and 40, 400 views, we can see that the pixel required for a smartphone will go from today's 400 PPI to the 2,000 to 8,000 PPI for 3D light field smartphones. For 3D 4K TV, we need 350 PPI to 1,400 PPI. Since more views means better 3D quality, consumers and the market will demand more views every year for improving the 3D display performance. Therefore, the light field display will drive a mega trend in the display technology, creating a more slow type industry roadmap. It poses a big challenge and also a huge opportunity for the entire display industry. Three D display will also drive significantly more semiconductor semiconductor hardware content. For example, more GPUs and more memories, in addition to more demand. Semiconductor business is all about the data creation, data transmission, data calculation, data mining, and the data storage. The nature 3D will drive huge data creation, huge data flow, and huge data storage. All of this will drive significant semiconductor content. In summary, we are just in the beginning of a very exciting era of display. Display are the window to the fast growing information universe. Humans are visual, are visual creatures and will keep demanding better and better display. Many display technology infractions such as VR, AR, micro LED display, 
and the natural 3D display will drive more consumer demand and the increase semiconductor and the related opportunity. So thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. Interesting. Hi, right. thank thank you, Dr. Xi. Yeah, thank you for for the insights and then help us walk through all the details. So we have some questions over here, and then our for our audience, please you know submit your Q and A as soon as possible. Don't wait till last minute so we cannot get through your questions because that we have a lot of questions today. We wanted to go through and wanted to ask our speakers. So the first question uh, we would like to ask. The U.S. is the largest consumer electronic market in the world, while Taiwan is a strong display manufacturer base. What are some potential areas that Taiwan and the U.S. can collaborate in the display industry in the future? Yeah, and I think uh, uh, Taiwan, as you said, has a very strong display uh, base technology and the talent layer. I think recently you can see both the Inolux and uh, AUO, they are doing very well this year. I think that due to this AOCD uh, demand, TV and IT uh, increase. I think down the road, as I point out, all this the technology, like a micro LED and the down the road, the VR, AR, and also the nature 3D display. I think uh, I strongly believe uh, Taiwan uh, display industry definitely can be part of that, the supply chain to enable is the VR, AR display and the natural 3D the display and the micro LED display. Uh, as I know currently, and uh, a lot of the Taiwan uh, based company and really focus on the micro LED. I think last is really is the right strategy and also uh, will have a good potential in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so previous uh, speakers mentioned about the shortage. So, is there going to be a shortage in the skill of labor force as supply chain shifts to other countries, or are certain materials getting more rare or harder to source? Um, what's what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I think the display also um, facing this challenge. I think uh, a lot of the IT smartphone. And the TV, uh, because of the, some of the IC chip shortage also cause uh, uh, supply demand issues. So I think a lot is a similar. And we are not kind of the, um, we do not uh, immune uh, compared with other industry like the auto industry. We also have the IC uh, chip shortage, which have impact on our final product, consumer product like the IT notebook smartphone that's similar. that's similar so on touch about uh based on the display so what about the laser in glasses directly riding on retina wait what, what's your what's your thoughts on this uh can you repeat your question again sorry sorry our team also like revising <laughs> so what about like laser in glasses directly writing on the retina display uh, uh, Joseph or Rex, do you have more uh, inputs on this question? Okay, let's move on to the next question while they're revising. So I, I don't want to waste your time. So um, how will how will the metaverse way affect the display industry? It seems that all we need is a VR headset. For example, we don't need real monitor, tablets, computers. Something, something like that in metaverse. How will it affect MAAT and other equipment com companies? Yeah, and I think the metaverse, as you say, there are a lot of things is uh, VR, AR, and MR, right? So I think the last definitely is uh, one of the future trend for display. But, but there is still a lot of the challenge. And uh, for example, do you have the right the wave guide? Do you really can uh, have the enough brightness of your display? I think there's still a lot of a challenging layer and uh, that's also create a lot of opportunity and uh, for the industry to solve it 
and ready to enable is the VR, AR, MR. That is the foundation for the uh, metaverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So on top of that, the uh, um, as the pandemic has allowed more flexibility work style outside of the office, do you see more large display demand in the future or right now happening, happening right now? Yeah, and we definitely see in the last two years, uh, as you point out, like, uh, uh, okay, okay, working from home, especially the kids studying from home, that's really kind of the stimulate uh, of demand on the, like, the IT notebook, and the tablet, uh, and also TV, since the the people, they cannot go outside for vacation, so they, the family money, they used to buy more TV and the bigger TV, we really see, that's why we see in the last uh, 12 months to 18 months, uh, a lot of our the customers, including in Taiwan, like the Inolux and also AO, their profitability really search very high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh... Another question. <laughs> There's so many questions. We're trying to decide. Okay. Another question is how has the uh, topographic for the display industry evolved in the modern era of geopolitical trade war? Uh, where has this display industry uh, large remain the same with a minimal impact? Yeah. And the reason speaking, because display is not a classified as a national security technology. So, so I think uh, compared with the other technology, especially semiconductor, I would say, yeah, we are less kind of the, uh, get impacted by this, the geopolitical or trade war issues so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do, you, what do you see the obstacle on the, you know, what's your like, you know, opinion on this obstacle or challenges on uh, the display manufacturing face in the future? I think uh, the display, the uh, issue facing in the future, I think for different technology, definitely I think there's a lot of this uh, uh, innovation and they need to be uh, created. And uh, so, and uh, also, how can we make sure those kind of innovation, we can do it in a very low cost and uh, the base, and then to really to stimulate the consumer willing to pay the money to buy it. <laughs> I think that's very, for example, like OLED TV. We all know the OLED TV is better than the LCD TV. Mm -hmm. But today you can see OLED TV still is roughly about 3% or 2% of total TV market. Only one reason is because the cost is still high. So how can we really uh, design and uh, find a new way to manufacturing OLED TV and uh, can get, can lower the cost. I think a lot will stimulate the consumer market. Then we can really to move uh, to the next level about the display uh, technology and also business. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think that's all the question we have right now. Yeah, a lot of the questions on the display and then, um, now we're, you know, learning a lot of like display aspects. So we have a semiconductor, like different aspects and shortage. And then, you know, like from the US side, and now we have data shared from, from the, your own perspective. It's very interesting. Thank you for your time and be here with us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alice. Very, oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So next one, let me share my slide. Ah. Do the present. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Shit. And now we're going to our last speakers. So for our last speakers, uh, last but not the least, and um, our last speaker, Kali Huang, president of Digit Times. I apologize, I was slip of tongue earlier. <laughs> Keep announcing it wrong. But uh, Kali Huang is a media executive veteran ICT analyst and best-selling author with 35 plus years of experience and close connections with many key players in the ICT industry and government sector. So Kali, so please, yeah. Take, yeah, please take away. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. 
It's my great honor to be invited by Natya again. Uh, even the second time to invite me to speak to you. And I think I need to introduce myself and my company again. This time is a high-tech newspaper. We just focus on ICT supply chain, especially. And we publish about 100 articles on news every day. And yearly, we also publish about 320 reports about. And my company actually co-invested by industry leaders, including the founder of TSMC, founder of Acer or MyTech, I mean, Maurice Sunstenshi and all of the industry leaders of Taiwan, they invest each times. Today, we have almost uh, close to 200 people work with me. I'm the founder of this company. And uh, myself, I come back to Taiwan in 1985. That year was a taking out year of Taiwan because Taiwan tried to produce personal computers. And uh, the, the, the new standards, you know, we follow the IBM computer PC standard and also we leverage Microsoft Windows and also leverage Intel CPU and become a, a very successful business model and extend to uh, mobile phone uh, about year 20, uh, year 2000. So t Taiwan today, we have about 800 listed electronic companies. They do start trading in Taiwan stock market. Even we only count those companies together Last year, revenue was close, uh, close to 800 billion US dollars. That's a big deal. And uh, we just checked uh, uh, the, the first three quarters this year. The top seven companies in Taiwan includes Foxconn, includes uh, Wishong and uh, uh, Pegatron. If we count the uh, TSMC, the top seven companies together, I believe this year, the growth rate of the Taiwan high tech industry will close to 15%. So this is the first year we reach nine, 900 billion US dollars. This is a big deal and uh, there is very important and significant for worldwide ICT supply chain as well. So I take the subject, like the perspectives on Asian ICT supply chain movement. And uh, myself, actually, and if you count, Taiwanese dialect is one of the language. I speak four languages. But unfortunately, as I say, I always say that English is worst. Uh, if you don't understand my English, I I, I just can say uh, sorry. But you know, I speak Korean well, and uh, that's good for me to understand whole Asia Pacific uh, as a region, especially. So I I started in Korea. I lived there two years, and come back to Taiwan in 1985. And government recruit me as a as an analyst, and I work for MIC Market Intelligence Center. There is the largest think tank in 1970s and 1990s. And uh, 1998, I got invitation from uh, industry leaders. They convinced me to to found a company called Dish Times. Looks like Dish Times is a media company, but actually, as I mentioned, we publish many reports, and also we have English versions. If you know, uh, Dish Times Asia, that is uh, uh, well known in high tech field, and we have more than I think 15,000 subscribers in Silicon Valley, as I know. So anyway. We are a witness of the Taiwan story, and uh, also we conduct a lot of survey about whole Asia, not only Taiwan. And we also have branch office in, in China, in other countries, and co-work with uh, uh, Korean high-tech media, Japanese high-tech media, and we work with India closely as well. So this is the background of these times and myself. And you still remember, I believe, in February this year, when uh, Mr. Biden become uh, United States president, and he announced formally, he said, America tried to uh, seize the new opportunity from supply chain. It's very to focus, focus on four major items. First one is semiconductor, second one is battery, then uh, rare earth and the medicine. But as you know, most of the upstream, uh, all of the industries are happening in North, Northeastern Asia. But Taiwan is always think about that what G2 really needs and what we can do something for China, for, for America as well. And I think the, the best way is to create a new marketplace, especially in Southeast and Asian countries. As you know, South Asian countries, they have, uh, uh, they, they have something like 650 million people live in Asian countries and uh, more than 2 billion live in, uh, uh, close to 2 billion live in South South Asia, like India, Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh. 
So how to, if, if we can help them to build their own industry, and there is something to do with the distributed uh, manufacturing uh, supply chain in the future. So Taiwan could be a very important, important springboard for this kind of needs, not only for China, America, but also for the emerging countries. So I personally, I believe Taiwan can play more, more important role in the future, especially in the coming decades. So we need to get a great, uh, greater picture about Asia. Two years ago, I published my nice book, Asian Age. This is about the geopolitical age and the cutting edge technology as well. Uh, I believe you still remember, uh, after Second World War, Japan, Korea, Taiwan become, uh, became the first line when uh, during a Cold War stage. And uh, today, Taiwan, Japan, Korea still in the front line. But the weapons, strategic weapons become high-tech island chains because supply chain and because semiconductor industry. You know, most of the memory ICs derived from Korea and uh, more than uh, most of the, the foundry services provided by Taiwanese company as well. And uh, you have to believe 61% of the Korean semiconductor exported to, to China. And uh, Taiwan, another 60% we export to China directly. Do you know that most of the China airline companies this year, they lost huge money, at least 200 billion US dollars, but only two companies still making profits. One is Korean airline, another one is China airline in Taiwan. So we, 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 we are still making profit. It's, it's, it's about semiconductor and the supply chain because most of the key components still derive from Taiwan and Korea. But today we, we are only shipped, mostly we ship to China. But uh, if you believe that, three years later, I believe 30% of the noble PC, we will move to Vietnam and 10% to 15% move to Thailand. In the today, Foxconn, Pekatron, and uh, and uh, Wishtron, they they are building uh, new factories in India. They try to serve the companies like Apple, like Xiaomi, or Lenovo, and even Acer in in India market. So there is a big change, and I believe Hudson will be in Indo-Pacific area. And uh, so uh, before COVID nineteen, I traveled to many countries. I met many ministers who in charge high tech like uh, Filipino and uh, Vietnamese. And also I met the, the, the minister who in charge high tech in India. So they all, they all asked me a lot of questions about how they can damage Taiwan and become a critical player. So, you know, Taiwanese government always say Taiwan can help. That is really sick. That, that, that is true. Taiwan is so helpful because I always say that because we don't have the brands. We are harmless partners for those kind of emerging countries. And it's, it's impossible for Taiwan, uh, a country like a 23 million population, it's impossible for us taking care of everything together and by ourselves only. So I always talk to the industry leaders like uh, Foscon chairman, Yang Liu, he presents earlier this morning and uh, he's my good friend. So I invite him to participate. And uh, he also uh, share a lot of things about us. Today we have a new supply chain. It is not like before. Not, not like before, because you know, he mentioned about EVs. And uh, most of the EVs, I mean, traditional car makers, they rely on, rely on tier one, tier two, tier three, traditional way to provide uh, provide the components. But uh, as he mentioned this, uh, today, and he say, uh, ICT supply chain will join this kind of, and uh, break on, breaking off all of the supply chain, not like before. So this chart actually, Original copy I I chat with the founder of Foscom, Terry Guo, in, at his home, and we discuss a lot of things about Taiwan law in the future. In the coming decades, I believe some of the uh, key components cannot ship to China, but who are the gatekeeper? Well, I, I always say there are three major gatekeeper. One is one is EMS company, electronic manufacturing service company like Foscom, Wishtron, and Pegatron, and also. Uh, some of the companies, uh, like they're doing component distribution, like uh, Abnet, like WPG or uh, Wenye. They, they could be the, the get, uh, gatekeepers, but also the companies like UL and uh, uh, SGS. Do you know UL has more than 1,000 people working in Taiwan? Do you know SGS? They issue uh, ISO 9000 or something. 
in, in the market of, to help the industry to build the infrastructure. There are more than 3,000 people working in Taiwan. So Taiwan is a very healthy and strong, comprehensive ecosystem in Taiwan. So recently, an uh, ambassador of the Canadian government, he come to my office. This is the first time he come to see me and because I talked to him. You know, the, the company like Mekna, Mekna is one of the top five, top five tier one car uh, auto, automotive industry uh, components provider. And they also do electronic manufacturing services. They're located in Toronto and uh, they, they are one of the top five uh, revenue close to 300, uh, the, so, sorry, 30 billion dollars. But I just talked to the investor. I say, if if you only run the traditional way, it's almost impossible because semiconductor getting more important and the display also. You know, Taiwan's AUO and uh, and uh, other display companies, now, now AUO has become uh, number three, car use display. I mean, CID or others, they are getting more important than before. So. I just say, if you want to assembly car in your country, because the advanced countries like Canada, uh, uh, America, Germany, Japan, and Korea, normally seven to ten percent of their GDP contributed by automobile automobile uh, industry. But if the supply chain, traditional supply chain, is breaking off, and uh, how, how they can survive? So, so the best way is to co-work together to build a new system for the future trends. And uh, only two weeks ago, in Taiwan, we have the Mount J 20 years anniversary, and we, we held a big event. I'm one of the speakers at that time, and we discussed many things about the Taiwan role, Taiwan's role in automobile industry and electric car in the future. And uh, we also talked to uh, many embassies in Taiwan, and uh, now they, they, they're watching us. They know if they want to build a new industry, not only Canada, but Mexico or even Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and uh, we have many appointments They're from uh, foreign uh, uh, offices to come to Taiwan and co try to co-work with us. So optimistically, I, I would like to say in the coming decade, I mean 10 years, Taiwan is going to welcome a very prosperous Paris uh, industry uh, opportunities. So they, but we need to know how to, how to run this kind of business successfully. So the best way for us to forecast, we have a lot of market opportunities, but you know, we cannot rely on other companies, uh, uh, research companies or market research uh, consulting companies that they conduct survey in Taiwan or in Asia, because we are totally different, because we, we only focus on supply chain. I run that kind of business long, longer than 30 years already. You know, in the in, night, in mid of 1980s, I have a, I had a job to go to our customers to check every company's exporting figures, how many PCs we ship to uh, Scandinavian countries, we ship to France, we ship to America or, or Canada. So there is a detail, there is raw data. Raw data now, uh, people talking about the shortage of the IC or semiconductors, but you know Taiwan is in the upstream. So we have the best opportunity to to check all of the supply and the demand system. So this time running the kind of business successfully, we, we, we conduct survey, especially focus on noble PC servers and, uh, and the handset. And also we, we, we are going to have the cars, automotive industry survey in the, in, in the coming years. And we also select 100 top uh, supply chain companies in Asia. And you have to believe 95% uh, 95 companies are or from uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. Only 5% five, five companies uh, was growing up in the South Asian countries. So I believe most of the solutions for automobile industry in the future will be from North Asian countries if, if they want to build their own industry. So we also have to, also have to, have to know after a post-COVID-19, people walk, up, walk from home and how, how serious they impact the industry. And you, do you know that? This year, we believe Noble PC has about 19% growth rate. This is the best, best year over last decade. And uh, we, we check the kind of number, uh, figures uh, every quarter, and uh, also give you the, the, the supply chain 
we only science like which which items like uh, PMIC, uh, power management IC or, or drivers, uh, the, the shortage and the oversupply, something like that. So you can check the Canon number. As I mentioned, we have the English version. If you want to go detail, and they, they, it's easy for you to understand. There's a third quarter. This quarter and how, how big change. And uh, we now we select 100 different key components. We will give you more detailed data in, in the coming years. And we also survey smartphone market in in greater China area, especially. Now, China getting uh, still keep a very important position. And in worldwide, we believe uh, 1.3 billion uh, smartphone is going to go to the market. But you know, the growth rate is not big as we, we expect before, only 6.4% growth compared to last year. But in case of the 5G smartphone, uh, China is still keeping a significant position, and uh, more than half of the worldwide 5G mobile phone derived from China. There is about the China policy. China trying to uh, uh, leverage Chin circle hypothesis after US China trade war. They, they need to create the domestic market. So, charming and attractivity to attract the companies like Qualcomm, Qualcomm, Nvidia to come to China. Uh, just like before. So to build a local market attractivity, that is a very important policy and strategy for China. But the final way uh, and the final end for China economic development, they still need to rely on global markets. So materials and the processing of the technology into uh, export modes, that is also important. They also need to attract more FDI technicians, new tech equipment to come to China. But that is not as easy like before. My uh, precedent speaker, uh, Brian, he mentioned about LCD, a lot of things about LCD. But I would like to give another figures. According to the data uh, from Dish Time survey, in year 2023, 73% uh, 70, 70, of the traditional LCD which come from China production side, 73%. They is significant. The rest of the 21% we from Taiwan. But so in case of the economic scale, we cannot compete with China. So uh, Taiwanese uh, panel makers, they now they emphasize one thing. There is application driven, better than product driven approach like before. So the, the business model is changing significantly. China consumed almost 60% of the worldwide IC market. Maybe the, 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 the number is, is big, big different from SIA, but I believe about 36% of the semiconductor consumed by local companies, another 22% about consumed by multinational companies. Because as I mentioned, 60% of the Taiwan exports of semiconductor export to China directly, and the Korea also 61% export to uh, to, to, to China. Today, Taiwan has a capacity of the worldwide semiconductor manufacturing is about 20%, when Korea has 19%. There is the figures from, from, from Boston Consulting Group. But in case of the branding, like, uh, like uh, NVIDIA, uh, Qualcomm, Broadcom, AMD or others, US company also contribute about 55% of the branding. And when Taiwan has 8%, Korea has 20%. Korea 20% is about memory ICs, especially. But in case of the foundry, I think uh, TSMC will be bigger than Samsung about three to four times. This is different. But this chart is very easy for us to understand what's different. According to the survey by Boston Consulting Group, and they said, and uh, China, China created about 60% of the demand, and about only they, 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 they have 16% supply. But in case of the foundry, Taiwan is 64%. 64% that includes Samsung's foundry business. But if we don't count the company like IDM, Samsung or Intel, Taiwan is 77% of the foundry services worldwide market. That is a big market. And, uh, and uh, Taiwan also has 40% of the uh, packaging and testing company. But actually, the, the number is not true. And uh, they say China has 40%. China has only 22% to 23% about. I think PCG may count Taiwanese company, they, their production base in China, like ASE or others. 
Taiwan, Taiwanese company has about 55 to 57 percent worldwide market impaction and testing. And so, and the others is not only three percent. So if you can check this number, and uh, as I know, in the first, first half of this year, China Im imported semiconductors 5% from Malaysia because Malaysia is another very important site for packaging and testing uh, company like Western Digital and uh, they, they have their assembly lying in, in Penang or Malaysia. And also Japanese company like Rome, they have assembly line in Philippines and Thailand. So. The rest of the Asian countries, they're also important in this field. But a uh, gentleman from SIA, he also mentioned about EDA2, IP data too. Still, uh, American companies uh, taking significant position and also uh, equipment as well. Like a primary material uh, claim that they are the number one, 70.2 billion US dollars revenue in equipments, very true. American still very important, but people like to know how boundary companies competitive and how Taiwanese company like TSMC, like UMC successfully. I think we need to think three pillars to think about boundary competitiveness. One is process technology, second one is ecosystem, then client structure. That is both very important. But it's, it's almost impossible, very difficult to, to handle three, three things together. So you may stuck in the middle, that is difficult for them. But taking the uh, history and the TSM transformation from mid of 1970s. So in the first first decade of TSMC, they just a company like a pure foundry companies. You know, founder of TSMC, Marish Chang, he always, he always emphasized one thing. There is integrity. He he knew, he knew. If you want, if you want to be a reliable partner, you need to focus on and you need to leverage the best things of Taiwan. Uh, at that time. So at that, in the first decade, TSMC is it, just a foundry company, so it's not, nothing special. But in the second decade, especially uh, about year 2000, TSMC invests a lot of money, huge money in R&D and the technology, and they become the technology leader. In the, uh, after economic crisis, year 2009, and the, the combined technology and the capex investment, after year 2009, as I know, most uh, almost uh, one third of the TSMC revenue invested in in capex, and at the EUV stage, they have forty percent, and today they have more than fifty percent of their revenue invested in capex. So there is a there is a very different approach, because TSMC founder Maurice Tang, he, he just said about ten years ago, he said he is a learning curve believer. He said even we are leader. Price is important because there's a learning curve. It's, it's very difficult for follower to, to compete with them. Uh, just an example, as I mentioned, TSMC revenue is three to four times of, TSA, of Samsung in foundry business. But TSMC is 8% in R&D. So which means if Samsung foundry team has the same capability, they, they need to invest at least 30% to compete with TSMC, that is almost impossible. And uh, you, you also have to think out of capacity and the ecosystem. So companies like a Synopsis Cadence or Primary the SML, they also like to co-work with TSMC. So there's an ecosystem. And then today when companies, you know, countries like America, Japan, Germany, they're trying to uh, invite Taiwanese companies to go their company to go their countries for investment. As I mentioned, Taiwan is a foundry company, service company, so we are harmless. Now, there is an important uh, uh, characteristic to, to take in a very special position. So in the first decade, Taiwan's core value is we, we have we position ourselves very successfully. Then we, we, we build a technology variety. Then we have the technology lead after the year 2020. So proposition and ecosystem is also important for Taiwan. So we need to understand how to cover with global basis with other countries. So this chart lets you understand. At the year 2015, about 30%, 30 to 35 percent, our capex invest uh, our our revenue invested in capex. But at the EUV stage, almost 40 percent. And today we have 50 percent or even above invested in uh, investing in capex. 
So there is a very different things. And believe it or not, this year, Taiwan's capex in semiconductor industry, our growth as high as 75%. This is almost impossible. And uh, because, you know, American government uh, or other, go other uh, governments trying to convince Taiwan to invest more. And absolutely, there is a good stage for in expanding. But now people worry about two years later may oversupply. But you need to, you need to check carefully. Some of the company invest in, in Lexi, in very mature technology. So because in, in, in the new solutions like uh, drivers or uh, uh, power management IC or others, they may need uh, the, the most advanced technology. There is the strength of Taiwan. Flexibility is also very important for Taiwan, and uh, our industry is, is very up to date, and uh, we know. And the uh, gentleman from Washington, D.C., SIA, he also mentioned about uh, uh, the power utilities or others. Main power, maybe there's an infrastructure issue, and Taiwan really need to pay attention on those kind of things. So, but new technology like equipment materials, we need to work with uh, prime materials, we need to work with SML, and uh, also the, like a new technology, AI quantum in memory computing. And uh, now we, we don't have enough manpower or technicians to work with uh, with the industry. I also teach in, in the university, like Chao Tong University, Fengjia University, a Taiwan Science and Technology University. I work with many professors and uh, they, they say, yes, the, the, we, it's very difficult for us to, to, to satisfy the market demand. But how about Samsung and Intel, also different. Gentleman from uh, Washington DC SIA, he also mentioned about the, the overseas students in America, it declined and, uh, and the uh, local students only 20,000 20, every year. So there's a challenge for everyone, not, not only for Taiwan, how about Samsung, how about Korea, it's the same thing. Because you know, young generation is, is smaller than before. So horizontally, we need to work with Japan, Korea, uh, Japan, US and the Indo-Pacific countries in the future. Vertically, we have to integrate, uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, chairman of Foxconn, uh, Yang Yu, he, he mentioned about design house, need to work with the system house. There is a trend, like Tesla, like uh, Google, and uh, even Microsoft, and they may design their own chips. So how to work with them? There is also a, a vertical challenge for Taiwanese companies as well in the future. So Taiwan, Japan is a new alliance because uh, Japan and the Korea is it's not a good relationship especially in memory in this in semiconductor fields the only one approach possibly for japan that is taiwan so co-work with taiwan in upstream equipment materials and in the new technology like quantum aiot in memory computings or others so i, I believe taiwan and japan will co-work and especially check in together in the future and the taiwan another strategic partner will be india taking this this kind of charts you, you can understand among the top hundred supply chain vendors we we count uh, mobile industry automobile industry and uh, electronic industry together uh, but you know taiwan has 14 companies are in the top 100 list but we don't have any companies we do automotive industry but india all of the four uh, listed in the top 100 they all elect uh, they, they all doing uh automotive or, or, or bicycle or, or or this kind of things so and uh, I always talk to our, our, our industry senior people, our government officials. Don't just just learn uh, approaches like uh, Silicon Valley doing today. It's almost impossible for for us to think about new new entrepreneur just like Silicon Valley. Uh, in 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 the end of the June, I check in the CP Insight data. He say they say 750 unicorns. We have today but 50% from America and 21% from China. If we count the Indian English people and the UK is 31%. So the rest of the country is only uh, less than 20%. And why Taiwan don't have, don't have the uh, unicorns like this way. Taiwan market is smaller. So we need to think about a baby unicorn, not a real unicorn. Baby unicorn means maybe 100 million stars of market value. We need 100, not, not one or two. So Taiwan is different from other countries. We need to take in our own strategy, not the strategy from China, from America. So we are different from others. So Taiwan can help, yes. I, I suggest we may try to convince Central Science Park become a, 
a branch uh, to build a branch office in other countries, not only in India, Vietnam, or even in Silicon Valley, taking a different way to think about the Taiwan Taiwan way. So because time is limited, I cannot enough time to share with you. But I believe digital transformation they include optimized operation, product transformation, customer engagement, and employees involvement. But but data asset and business model even more important. If you don't have the business model, you have the data, it, it, it means nothing, uh, nonsense. So you must unlearn what you have learned. Yes, people in America, especially our young men, you may was born in Taiwan or, or your parents born in Taiwan, it doesn't matter. But you need to think a different way to think about Taiwan is different from from California. I had been uh, staying in California for, for six months about, so I, I, I look around. I know something different. We, we are different. So we can, because different, so we have the opportunities for complementary co cooperation. So this is my presentation. I think, I, I hope it's helpful for you to understand Taiwan and the uh, whole Asia. So I travel around. And uh, next week I have the, pre I have an invitation from Korea government. They want to know how Taiwan think about high tech. So I try to give them different perspective to think about Taiwan and the South Asian countries. Okay, it's my presentation. I hope it's helpful for you to understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kali Wong. Yeah, thank you for this great, great sharing and insights. I, I learned a lot like today just for um, from other speakers as well, uh, like talent shortage, chip shortage, and how to find people, how we educate, you know, the students, and um, I'm just thinking now maybe in the future, we're gonna send our kids just to study engineering in the future to help us all the semiconductor. So yeah, we have some questions for you. Uh, both the US and Taiwan have events and cutting edge semiconductor uh, process technology. And there are some differences like culture of innovation and manufacturing capability. Can you share about some thoughts on how do you think that they can work together? I know you mentioned briefly on your kind of toward the end of the slide, but what, what do you think that how US and Taiwan can work closely together? Oh, you know, just 10 days ago, as I mentioned, I was invited by Mongjie Association for 20 years anniversary to give the first presentation in, in the event. I, I was a keynote speaker and I introduced how Taiwan can work with, with America. I because I, I present them in, in Mandarin. I'm not sure about all of you can understand my, my Mandarin because it is more uh, it's more close to understand what, what what's different. I say that You know what it means for that? Can you explain or, or translate for, for that? You, you need to know the gesture of, of, of the pigs, then you know how to kill them. <laughs> right? So they, they say different things. So if you're talking about the TSMC or UMC, the management of the orders from world class company, just pipeline management. Just for example, if you have the four giga fabs for 100,000 capacity, and uh, which means you need to allocate all of the resources in different nodes like uh, 40, uh, like, like uh, 20, 28 nanometers, like 20 nanometers, 16, 10, 7, 5, or even 3. So resource allocation is, is a big issue for this kind of company and very sensitive, critical. And uh, the question is, why American government ask these questions? Okay, if you know how to ask us questions, we know how to answer your questions. <laughs> but supposedly, American government thinks like they don't understand what is the real, real questions. So I just talked to the audience 10 days ago. I mean, in Chinese, we have uh, three different uh, terminology. Xian ji, xian ji, xian ji. The first the xian ji is about the technology. Gong xian ji shu. So we share our technology to others. Okay, no problem. If you ask us to go to Arizona, to bring our technology to Arizona, yes, yeah, we can help. Second one is Xian Ji, Ji Pin the Ji, Bai Bai the Ji, Worship. <laughs> so, 
if you ask uh, ask us no any no any conditions just ask us to to share oh okay Taiwanese may say yes we can we can give to you the the last one is xian ji ji ce de ji strategy so we can try to give you strategy if you don't you really understand so we need to talk so I just say if the government plays a role to become the window for negotiation or discuss, uh, discussion, that's very difficult, very difficult because American government may trust them, may not trust them. So we are second channel because Monje or, or not Natia will be the second channel to, to discuss, to, to, to discuss the possibility for different ways. This is for complementary or win-win strategy. Because Taiwan is a small country, as you know, we only have 0.4% of the population worldwide, 0.4%. But we have more than 20% and 77% of the foundry in the world. So we, we're taking too much load. There's an overloading for Taiwan. The only one thing we can survive is to leverage everything together. So if we go Arizona, there is a 20,000 capacity. This is we call mega fab. But in Taiwan, we have four giga fabs. Every fab, they have about 100,000. And in, uh, just like Yang Liu, he mentioned this morning, our, our cost is at least 30% lower than America. So if you want to build the Taiwanese style manufacturing site, it's almost impossible. It's not efficient, not for Taiwan, not for America. It's not even for the world. So it's not a right approach. So we need to talk. We need to talk more detailedly, professionally. And this is what I suggest to you. And secondly, the last process is passion and testing. As I mentioned, 57% of the worldwide passion and testing companies are Taiwanese company, and they all listed in Taiwan stock trading market. So it's not difficult for us to, to, to trace. Company like ASE, like many, that I don't need to emphasize. But do you know that TSMC also has four factories that are doing passion and testing. Mm -hmm. So just like a good Mr. Gurich, he say, no any country, no any company can dominate this industry by themselves because all we cross boundary work together. So Taiwan is just like a leverage. And as I mentioned, even logistics. Do you know when SML, they ship their, their EUV equipment to Taiwan and who can take care for that? They use 777 air cargo to carry all of the equipment mm. to Taiwan directly. And Taiwan become the service hub not only for Taiwan, but also for Korea, Japan, China, and Singapore, because we are in the hub. We are in the hub, not only logistic hub, but also because we have TSMC, UMC, we have very successful semiconductor industry, and we have technical people, technicians. They have abundant experience for handle that kind of projects by Taiwan ourselves. So we work with SML, we, all, always, we work with a prime materials, but I just believe we can even work more closer. Most of the headquarters in America, you ask them if they really understand <laughs> supply chain of Taiwan, supply chain of Asia. You know, every day I spend about one hour to read Korean native language about the industry every day, as long as longer than 30 years. Yeah, people say I'm the best Korean expert in Taiwan about high tech. You have to believe Samsung invited me as a torch relay player in during Olympic, uh, winter Olympic three years ago. They want to know. So I know that they invite us to go, but I, I'm not going to Silicon Valley open because Silicon Valley based company always say they are the, they are the top. Yeah, something like that. But you know, Asia Pacific supply chain is different because they change dramatically. We need to work with American-based company together. That is true. That is true. We would be eager to, to do that. But we have our operation to think about cooperation in the future. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I learned so much. It's kind of like 
you give and take, and then you know where your position. So then, then you approach for different, you know, strategy and stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin. Rex, do you want to um, add in anything? Yeah, actually, we have uh, one question here to ask you, uh, Colin. Um, yes. You had mentioned that Taiwan should find uh, new innovative ways, uh, such as, you know, expanding the Shinzu Science Park to beyond the borders of Taiwan or other ways to have more local collaboration. Um, the question is, can you share maybe some examples, concrete examples, how these Taiwan semiconductor industry can collaborate with a lot of Silicon Valley powerhouse in, you know, these could be big companies like NVIDIA um, or AMD or, or even successful startup unicorns that we've seen. For example, you know, Intel has acquired Havana in recent years in AI. Uh, Qualcomm has purchased Novadia uh in ai to incorporate into their modems um can you maybe share some ideas of examples how taiwan semiconductor should collaborate with uh silicon valley thank you thank you i think the most important thing is to create new marketplace for everyone even amd nvidia qualcomm they won't they won't they, they are very welcome the new opportunities from emerging countries and I personally, I believe, you know, industry like PC and the handset, I mean, mobile phone, they are the, they were the top down approaches. We only need to serve the companies like Apple, like HP Dell, like servers, Noble PCs, Acer, Asus, then we are success. But in the future, as, as uh, Mr. Liu mentioned this morning, the manufacturing system is changing. Countries like Vietnam, Thailand, India, they're trying to build their own automobile industries. And if Qualcomm, Broadcom want the opportunity, uh, or NVIDIA want the new opportunities, not only watching the opportunities in, in America only. Do you know Indian market now is number five automobile industry in the world? Do you know that? 2.7 million shipments. And do you know they are the number one motorbike in the market in the world in, in the world? 20 million shipments. And only 0.1% their cars are electric, electric. So can you imagine when the top 20, the most polluted cities, 15 of them, they are in India. So there is a challenge for us, for all of us to help. India to become or to use green energy to have the uh, air pollution uh, quality, air, air quality or something like that. Secondly, post COVID-19, unemployment rate must be, should be a very difficult issue for emerging countries, especially. Once I ask Mr. Liu, Yang Liu and his founder, Terry Go, we three people, we, we were together, I ask them, Two chairmen, may I ask you a question? How many employees do you have? And they, they watch each other. They don't answer me. Yang Liu is my good friend. And he say, Kali, I'll let you know tomorrow. Okay. Next day, he called me. He said, Kali, we have 1.3 million population. Uh, so 1.3 million employees worldwide. So I say, Yang, this is the most important contribution your company to the world. You that unemployed, uh, uh, you that unskilled laborers got opportunities, got the jobs for their family, for their house. There is a great contribution to the world. People in Taiwan was born in Taiwan. Everybody know Dian Guo, Da Tong Dian Guo. Do you know that? Oh, if, yeah. I, I, if you're Taiwanese, you must know Dian Guo. Yes. But anyway, I I just talked to. CEO of Da Tong, uh, two, two weeks ago, he's my good friend. I said, what, what is the most important contribution Da Tong to the society? He said, Dian Guo. I said, no, not Dian Guo. In 1970s, 1960s, farmers, workers, they work in the factories when they go home. If they need to cook, they spend at least 30 minutes to one hour for the rice, 
Okay, now it's one button to search, to help us. So we have a one one hour more, one hour more to have a, to to enjoy our life. So manufacturers looks like humble. No, looks like not interested. How working? Ten hours a, a day, but speak for English. We are Taiwanese are so lucky because we have personal computer platform. Then we build the infrastructure. We have Shinto Science Park. We have good policy. We work together and we open the in financial market, stock market for emerging countries, com companies. And now that we extend our capability to other countries. So now we are the bridge for Silicon based, Silicon Valley based company to go come to emerging countries because NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Broadcom is almost impossible to reach to the, to the, to the, to the last uh, end market to co work the end user is almost impossible. The world is changed. So I always say that year 2000 to year 2020 was a golden era of supply chain because Taiwan and China participate, WTO, Taiwan leverage China, China leverage Taiwan. So we build a very efficient supply chain. But now the world is changed. Use China trade war. Let us to think about maybe Taiwan is more potato. Don't try to leverage each one, but create opportunities for both sides. There's things we can do. So it's also good for emerging countries, good for the, the world. So I always talk to Taiwanese citizens. I say, yes, we can help. Her. We can help. So we are helpful for people like that way. So no any other countries, believe me, because I study Korea a lot. Korean companies they don't have the global mass production system. No. Only Foscom, only Wishtron, Pegatron, Guangda, and the Eventech. They have the real, they are they are 20 billion US dollars company. So only those company, maybe the gross margin only 60%, but there are no room for, for error. So we know how to survive. And in the coming decade, Taiwan will still survive and uh, maybe not profitable, but we must survive because people need us. So that's my, my observation. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the very insightful uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you. I will let, uh, give it back to Alice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I think we covered everything. Yeah, really, thank you. Um, and I see in the chat that uh, people are curious about your slides as well. And thank you, colleagues, for sharing all the insights. And then I, I, we, I mean, I personally learned a lot and I've been like taking notes on my notebook right now. So I'm just not, I'm trying not to, Hey, okay, pay attention to you. I'm just like taking notes because it's, it's, I learned a lot so much tonight. Okay, and, I'll charge you next time. <laughs> you want to charge? Oh, please don't. I, I I'm not. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I, I charge more. Is I charge ten go. <laughs> Already. Thank you. Just job. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much you. for your time and thank you for Digital Times to support us this Nadia's event. Yeah. So. Thanks everyone for today and uh, tonight morning. And uh, we have a survey in the chat in the link. And remember to sign up our part two event next week. And yeah, we would love to hear, hear your feedback. And uh, you can leave your link in um, in the chat. We'd love to connect with you. So next Friday, we hope to see everyone over there next Friday. And thanks again, Kali Huang, to be yep, here with you. us today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, see you in Silicon Valley. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, bye. Welcome to New York. I'm in New York. <laughs> yeah, so everyone, that is all for tonight. Uh, I can show you my um, slide because uh, I also see we have some people uh, here. So uh, let me, oops, uh, sharing share my final slide so it's just the link that for you to um to navigate that uh where is our event website 
and uh, and you can also provide feedback. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. All right. So, can I share really quickly? There you go. So, this is the link I also put in the chat. So you can have, uh, you can uh, either, you know, uh, scan it where you can click the link. We would love to hear your feedback. And here are our awesome author, Kali Wan. He is the author for this Canada ICT supply chains. So just some supporting over here and on your chain, Kerry Wu. Yep. And thank you again for everyone's attending and, um, I also want to shout out our team again that they're just background working and help us to do live screening. I'm just the front person to help them to speak, but yeah, really thanks for our team, Joseph uh, Chen and uh, everyone, you know, Mark, Jimmy, Rex, Julia, uh, Julie, Ch uh, Chi Chen, and Ethan. Um, yeah, everyone here to work this uh, event and make it very perfect. Uh, and also our volunteer as well. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people. I saw some emoji here. So people were like, wow, yes, a lot of people here uh, to make this happen. And we do this every year. So we hope to see everyone next year as well. Yeah, thanks again for joining us tonight and hope you have a good weekend. All right.